Nowhere in the world, except in the United States, is it legal to administer drugs to horses before races. Here, the drugs Lasix and Phenobutazone, known as Butazolidin and Butte, are permitted in every major racing state except New York. Tomorrow, the Illinois Racing Board begins hearings on permissive medication, a problem many feel is getting out of control, and Jeannie Morris has a report. Horses were born to run. There's nothing cruel in plain and simple horse racing. What is cruel, say a growing number of veterinarians, horsemen, and concerned citizens, is the permissive use of drugs to keep unfit horses on the racetrack. Hey! Race horses do break down. It's a hazard of the game. Yet some studies show a significant increase in breakdown since the pre-race use of phenylbutazone, known as Butte, became legal in 19 states. This report is the result of a three-year study by horse owner Bob Baker, a St. Louis stockbroker. It is a damning compilation of expert research and opinion on the pre-race use of phenylbutazone, Lasix, and other drugs. Baker first learned about drugs and horses by taking care of his own animals at Illinois' Cahokia Downs racetrack. Well, in my own stable area, there were horses that they were so severely injured that the trainers would not take them to the racetrack for training between races. He was so afraid that the horse would break down just training for the race. And if the horse was going to break down, he ought to be trying to make some money. Uh, I've seen some horses that even to the point where they were racing until they broke down. There was one horse in our stable that had a very enlarged ankle. It was very sore and would limp. You know, he couldn't even walk without limping, much less try to run. And they put him in a race, and they uh, gave him butazolidin, and he raced until his hand and leg broke completely in half. And another horse came up on top of him and fell over him and broke his shoulder. So here were two dead horses. Dr. Arthur Patterson, a veterinarian, is in charge of approving equine drugs for the Food and Drug Administration. He deplores the pre-race use of Butte and Lasix. What you must keep in mind, uh, Ninety percent of the trainers and the racing stables in the backstretch are living from hand to mouth, and they've got to they've got to win a bet every now and then to survive. You look at the posted chart; it has B's and L's beside different horses in the race. If you see a B beside a horse, what does that tell you as a better with your information? What does it tell me? Mm -hmm. That tells me that horse has got something wrong with him. He's got pain. He's got a pathological lesion somewhere that wants to prohibit him from running. And it tells me that if that horse is not on a painkiller, he's not ready to put his foot in the racetrack. What about Lasix? What about the L beside the horse's name? Then the question that conjures up in my mind is what other drugs are in this horse? Does this man really want to win with this horse? For instance, methadone will slow a horse down. You can slow a horse, you can tranquilize him, slow him down with it. These are where these drugs are used. Drugs used to influence races. Just whom does that benefit? Are Butte and Lasix dangerous to horses and therefore jockeys? Is Butte a painkiller? Lasix a mask for stimulants and depressants? Are these drugs, as the industry's majority claims, necessary to keep business going? Or is equine drug use just one more example of man's cruelty to animals? We'll examine these questions in further reports. Jeannie Morris, Channel 2 Sports. In 1973, Illinois legalized the pre-race use of the drugs butazolidin and Lasix. The results of this permissive drug use are now in, and they're not good, as Jeannie Morris reports in the second of a three-part series. When jockey Robert Pineda died in a four-horse crack-up on May 3rd, jockey Rudy Turcott, whose Mount Easy Edith snapped a foreleg to cause the mishap, blamed Butte, or Butazolidin, calling it a dangerous painkiller. It was a tragedy and an eye-opener at the same time. Pineda's family filed a $10 million lawsuit naming operators of Pimlico Racetrack, its general manager, the trainer, and the owner of Easy Edith. This lawsuit should fully air the butazolidin problem. Meanwhile, the Illinois Racing Board, Charles Schmidt presiding, today opened hearings on the pre-race use of Butte and Lasix, now legal in Illinois. The most telling witness was Dr. Arthur Patterson, who spoke to us earlier. So you see, butazolidin has two functions, three functions, in fact. One, it kills pain. Two, it enables the, the, the trainer owner of veterinary complex to control the form of that horse if they want to. Uh, and three, it masks other illicit drugs. 
So how do you put these kinds of tools in the hands of the racing industry and expect John Q. Public to come up there and bet his money? Humane Society representatives were delighted to hear Dominic Frenzy, representing the Harness Horsemen, ask for a rewrite of the rules to prevent drugs up to 72 hours before race time. Then the process of post-race testing of urine and blood samples was declared in some respects useless by Dr. John McDonald, head of the state lab. His data show conclusively that butte masks stimulants and depressants under normal testing procedures. McDonald said further that testimony given to the board on the subject in March 1976 by Kentucky chemist Dr. Gerald Blake was false and misleading. Misled or not, horsemen think they need butte and Lasix. Tom Kelly, trainer, has worked the backstretch for 40 years, and at the moment he has 29 horses, 15 employees, and too many racing dates. And uh, years ago, we'd turn out in the uh, wintertime and uh, just race in summer months and give your horses a chance to price them back up. And now you go 20, 24 months a year, or 12 months a year. You just go around the clock with them. Do you think that's the reason for the increase in use of drugs, to keep your stables going? Oh, you got to have it, yes. Uh, if it wasn't for that, I don't think you'd race. To, to be half these horses wouldn't be racing. And the, you got to have something to kill the pain. You've got to have something, perhaps. Something fair, something legal, something not dangerous to the life and health of man or mount. Jeannie Morris, Channel 2 Sports. For five years now, two drugs, butazolidin and Lasix, have been legally used on Illinois racehorses. A comprehensive report by Missourian Robert Baker released this week labels the legal drugs dangerous to horses, and the racing board is now evaluating Illinois drug rules. Jeannie Morris continues her series on that subject. The racetrack is a special world. The days are long, the work is hard, and for all the big money figures you hear about the industry, most of racing's people are not rich. That's one reason why the drug culture is booming at the races. A guy's got to make a killing now and then. But who really profits from the use and overuse of drugs? Repeatedly in our investigation, the answer has been the equine veterinarian. According to one expert, these vets make a minimum of $50 per horse every month and could be treating hundreds of runners. The only one benefiting from the administration of drugs is the veterinarian at the track that is administering the drugs. He is getting a very good price for the drugs, the pre-race drugs. Ninety-some percent of the horses are on pre-race medication. Therefore, he collects his bill. The ones who are losing are the owners. They're losing right and left. They have horrendous veterinarian bills. And the horse, in the long run, is losing many times paying for it with his blood. The veterinarian knowledgeable in the pharmacokinetics of drugs can move at liberty among most any running track in the country and depress or stimulate a horse with 99 and 41 percent chance that he's going to get by without being caught. Now that's a pretty broad statement to make. Mm -hmm. But I know I can do it and I know other people can do it too because there's a lot of very capable men out there on the field. Dr. Jane Lair is Arlington Park's track veterinarian representing the Illinois State Racing Board. Dr. Lair deplores the use of stimulants and depressants, but she, like her colleagues, feels that Butte and Lasix, the legal drugs, are necessary. Economically, it is not feasible to keep a horse on the track if he doesn't run. It costs $25 a day average to keep a horse in training. On top of that, you have to pay your veterinary bills, your shoeing bills, your jockey mounts, you have to pay tack bills, you have to pay shipping bills. It comes to the point where a horse costs so much to keep every year that if he is not on the track and racing and at least has a chance of making some return on the investment, that for the majority of people, they simply couldn't afford to own one. Horsemen argue that there aren't enough horses to fill increasing programs. But according to the Baker Report, using figures from 1952 to 1977, the number of races has increased 137 percent, while the number of runners has grown 160 percent, and the number of foals, 216 percent. Further statistics show that in 1961, before permissive medication, the average field was 8.91 horses while in 1977, after 19 states had legalized certain drugs, the figure was down to 8.82.
and consider the average starts per animal. 11.95 in 1961, only 9.8 in 77. So much for some economic advantages of legal drugs. Where will it end? It's too bad we can't ask 1973 Triple Crown winner Secretariat. It has never been publicly revealed, but Secretariat was on bodybuilding hormones called anabolic steroids during his racing life. These drugs are illegal if detected at race time. Secretariat's drug ingestion may have been the reason vets considered him a poor risk at stud after his original semen evaluation. Secretariat has been successful getting foals, yet many people have asked, why don't his babies look more like him? It is too early to tell if Secretariat's progeny will run like him. What an irony if the one animal, the racehorse, bred to perfection is ultimately destroyed by the greed of his breeder, his owner, his trainer, and his doctor. It's interesting that the Illinois Racing Board set out to consider whether to remove the restrictions on the amounts of butte and Lasix that can be administered to horses. But now, following a thorough investigation, the board may actually limit the pre-race use of drugs or ban them altogether. Jeannie, I'd like to ask you one question. We've been talking about for the benefit of the horse, you know, for the good of the horse. But what about the, the public better? How's he going to come out of this and what's going to be best for him? Interesting thing. Betters, I talked to quite a few of them. Yeah, they don't seem to care a whole lot about the drugging of the animals. It doesn't seem to be a factor uh, with many betters, but people who care about horses, it is indeed a factor. Okay. It sure would be a factor in trying to chart those horses, you know, be able to take the drugs into effect as far as the betting public is concerned. Even though you may not have been surprised at the outcome of last week's Kentucky Derby, Something else about the Derby may come as a surprise. If last week's race was anything like the Derby races for the last five years, most of the starters were running on drugs. Do these drugs have any effect on the outcome of the Derby? No one is sure. But the use of the drugs in Kentucky and some 18 other states has become the most controversial issue in racing today. The drugs are perfectly legal. The most common is fetal butazone, commonly known as bute, a powerful analgesic which deadens pain, and Lasix a diuretic. The state of Kentucky also allows some 40 other drugs to be in a horse while it's racing. One of the few places where house calls are still common in medicine is the backside of a racetrack. This is veterinarian Dr. James Hume on his morning rounds in the stable area at Sportsman's Park in Chicago. More often than not, these rounds include shots of either Butte or Lasix, the most popular drugs given to horses. When you give Butte to a horse that's sore, the horse will run full out, not feeling the pain. The trainers say that with the demands of the racing season, Bute is the only thing that will get these sore horses out on the track. At some tracks, 80% of the horses are running on either Bute or Lasex or a combination of both. Although Bute has been hailed by 90% of horse owners and trainers in this country as a boon to racing because it relieves soreness and inflammation, critics of the drug say that Butte makes a horse feel better than he really is, and that a horse running full out on a sore or injured leg could cause much more severe injuries to knees and ankles that are already weakened. There is evidence that more horses are having serious breakdowns and snapping their legs during the race, breakdowns like these spills filmed at various tracks. One sports rider, Russ Harris, who has specialized in racing for 20 years, did a study at Keystone Park outside Philadelphia. He came up with the startling statistics that after Butte was made legal, the breakdown rate at that track increased fourfold. Prior to Butte, a horse broke down on the average every 15 days. After the drug was legalized, the breakdowns averaged every four days. Other states noticed the same increase in breakdowns. Last year, a four-horse spell at Pimlico in Maryland resulted in the death of jockey Robert Pineda. The horse that fell, Easy Edith, was running on Butte. Until recently, jockeys would never speak out on this issue. But Nick Jamis, who heads the Jockeys Guild, decided to ask some questions. Last year, there was over 2,000 spills. In other words, horses went down with jocks on their backs. Of those 2,000 spills, at least 1,500 of those jockeys were hospitalized two weeks or more. 
And it appears the way it's going now, the injuries will be far greater than in 78. A, a horse going down all of a sudden, if he's absolutely sound, all of a sudden he breaks his leg without the appearance of that he clipped another horse's heels or that he was in tight. He just, and he's clear, he's not in the, in the midst of a pack of horses and he, all of a sudden he breaks his leg and goes down. We say, why? What caused this horse to break down like that? We are asking the questions and we want some answers. The answer from the Horseman's Benevolent and Protective Association is that there is no breakdown increase. Executive Director Tony Chamlin. Well, there hasn't been any documented proof of that to my knowledge, Harry. Uh, we've looked into this problem and there certainly is a problem with horses breaking down. <coughs> Excuse me, but this is caused, in, in our opinion, uh, by additional racing dates, by additional winter racing dates uh, on terrible track surfaces at times, uh, by the increase in number of times that uh, horses do race. Uh, there are a number of factors involved. It's the economics of the sport that has caused the dramatic rise in the use of drugs on the track. Horse racing in this country is now a billion dollar a year industry. This kind of money has poured a much needed windfall into state treasuries. States that had once been content with a six-month racing season began to demand longer and longer seasons to increase their revenue. Of the 22 states where racing is important to the economy, 19 of them permit horses to race on Butte and Lasix. The states that ban this use of the drugs are New York, New Jersey, and Arkansas. We talked to a trainer in California, Art Hess, who uses the drugs on his horses. Our horses are overraced. That's why most of we trainers feel that it would be very difficult to get along without butazolidine. And I don't know if the industry would be better without as many racing days, but I know from the owner's standpoint, who really buys the horse, puts out the big money, he's got to keep the horse running, or he just cannot make ends meet. When you start thinking that the average owner maybe has four or five horses with you and it's going to run 800 to $1,000 a month, he doesn't want the horse on a restful uh, vacation. He doesn't want to send it back to the farm. For Not if he doesn't have to. And within reason, the trainer will go along, and with the help of butazolidine and Lasix, he can keep that horse running. But there are people in racing who think that using but and Lasix on horses is wrong. Alex MacArthur is a cattle breeder in Illinois and was formerly the chairman of the Illinois Racing Board. When I was in, on a racing board, the parlor name for it was uh, pre-race medication. But out in the burn, we called it drugging and doping horses, because that's what it is. Uh, I'm against it, 100% against it. I think it's cruel to the horse. I think it's very cruel to the better. And I think that uh, it's cruel to the jockeys. These, these lads that are riding these horses now, they get these plastic horses out there, and one day I hope I'm wrong. Lord, I pray I'm wrong. But they're going to turn into the home stretch there, and they're going to have a real meltdown. You're going to see a, a big pile up there because these horses are running beyond their capacity. They're, uh, they're driving under the influence, so to speak. Look, it's, to me, it's very simple. If you love a horse, you love a sound horse, good horse flesh. Now, if a horse is lame or he's sore, you ought to rest him up. But giving him Butte or any of these other miracle drugs, all this is going to do is deaden the pain, kill the nervous system, which is nature's way of trying to tell that animal, go easy with me till I get a chance by natural process to heal. And you're going to just, wait, you're just going to treat this horse wrong. You're going to treat everybody else wrong that's betting on him too. Because that better, he doesn't know whether the horse is running hot or whether he's running cold, he's running with an upper or downer. Uh, how is he going to make an intelligent bet if there is such a thing? Do you think there's some time manipulation in terms of giving the horse medication for one race and not for the next? Oh, the of course better? there is. If they say it isn't, why, uh, they're fooling you. They don't like to use the word, but I'll use it, fix. And uh, the fix is in on some races. Of course it is. So far, we've been talking mostly about Butte. The other common drug, Lasix, is a diuretic, which is used on horses which are lung bleeders to control the bleeding. But critics say that the flushing action of the drug masks the presence of other illegal drugs during testing. There are reports that 80% of the horses are running on Lasix at some tracks, but the percentage of bleeders is nowhere near that figure. Nick Jamis. I've put 20 years in the saddle. 
I, I don't recall that I rode over 20 bleeders in those 20 years, confirmed bleeders. Certainly it wouldn't be uh, a case where you would need Lasex for 80% of the horses in the field. I don't think so. Some studies have shown that only about 5% of horses are confirmed bleeders. Well, why are so many running on Lasix? Chuck Schmidt is chairman of the Illinois Racing Commission. Well, the Lasix is a diuretic, uh, and with the diuretic effect, it flushes out great quantities of the medication that are in the horse, which can, in our state, where we have a quantitative limit on butte, it can take a horse who's been given more butte than permissible and flush it down to a level that's permissible for the test. And at the same time, if there's illegal medication in there, it'll help flush some of that out, too, leaving very minute quantities of that for us to find. The whole problem of whether any of these permitted drugs act to mask the presence of illegal drugs, or at least make it extremely difficult to detect their presence, can only be solved in the laboratory. The Racing Board Laboratory in Illinois is headed by John McDonald, who reluctantly agreed to discuss some of the problems of detecting illegal drugs. When you uh, add a add Butte or Lasix or any other controlled drug, some states have 40 controlled drugs. They allow 40 drugs in the animal. I think Kentucky's one of them. They uh, change the matrix of the urine sample, and they interfere with our various testing techniques. You think that uh, sometimes uh, would a trainer or a vet take advantage of that chemical fact? Absolutely. You think that happens fairly often in most states where they have controlled medication? I think they'll try anything. One of the more popular drugs for a long time was called sublimase. It's a synthetic described as a hundred times more powerful than morphine. It is absolutely illegal for this drug to be in a horse that's racing. The state racing chemists knew that some of the trainers and vets were using it. The problem was that until last fall, no laboratory had a test that could detect the presence of sublimase. Then John McDonald broke the code. When you make that kind of progress on a drug like sublimase, then what happens? Does another drug come along the next day? They're already using drug, new drugs. Our investigative teams have given us information on new, powerful analgesic substance far superior than to morphine. This is happening on the tracks today. There are drugs out there that you don't know anything about? Absolutely. Would you like to see a federal law that would give you some help? I'd like to see the FBI come in once in a while and give us an assistance. They don't help you? They've never talked to me since 1968. Are you getting a little cynical after some years in this business? Yes. You don't think you're going to win in your... Uh... I know I'm not going to win. No. But thanks to McDonald's findings with sublimase, other states whose labs were too small to test properly for the drug began sending him frozen urine samples from horses in races that seemed suspicious. Florida was one of the states. Dan Bradley regulates racing in Florida. You've got some disreputable trainers, disreputable owners, and disreputable participants who will use every device known to mankind to win a race. They don't care what it is. They don't care if it's administering drugs to a horse, bribing a jockey, using an electric battery. It makes no difference to them as long as they win the race. Um, I have had trainers that I respect have a great deal of, of admiration for their integrity and their ability, who, in a sense of frustration and in a sense of, 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 uh, of uh, willing to throw in the towel, are saying, Mr. Bradley, we don't use the illegal drugs. We know that some of the trainers do. We cannot possibly win. We know that we cannot win because the race is stacked against us. And the only way that I can win, and it breaks my heart to do so, is to also use illegal drugs. What's the situation in Florida? Are you a lenient state? We're not only lenient, we're extremely permissive, unfortunately. Uh, our drug medication program permits horse trainers to use uh, practically any drug or any medication in the treatment of their horses. Does that give you additional problems? Major problems. We have to segregate out or attempt to segregate out the permissible drugs and medication from the impermissible drugs and medication, and it's almost an impossibility. Permissible drugs like, say, but and Lasix. Uh, Butazolid and Lasix are the two most common permissible drugs, along with your vitamins and your steroids and a lot of other things. The year before last, the Florida Racing Lab reported 16 positives for illegal drugs. Last year it was 200, and the rate is even higher this year. 
and in my freezer right now in the state racing lab, we have about 2,500 suspicious samples that are frozen under lock and key. And all of the preliminary tests indicate that there's a foreign drug or foreign medication substance in these urine samples. The frustration that we feel is that we don't have sufficient personnel to work on these backlog of cases. I don't know that we ever will catch up, so we have to now use other techniques. And one of the techniques, of course, is doing barn searches, automobile searches. And recently we have hit upon another uh, tool that we hope is going to be effective, and that's the going around and checking the prescription uh, pads at the various drug stores to see who's been buying which drugs. We have gone to over 50 drug stores and drug suppliers that wholesale to the local retail drug stores. We have discovered especially at one drug store, which is located very near a major horse track here in Florida, that one doctor of veterinary medicine has, has prescribed uh, approximately 400 prescriptions to licensed horse trainers in Florida. And I here again, I'm not talking about aspirin and bufferin. I'm talking about class two control narcotics, especially dilated and sublimase. Can you name the drug store that filled these illegal prescriptions? I'd, I'd rather not uh, name it. It's a, it's a drugstore that's located in, well, I will name it. It it's, it's, uh, should be a matter of public record, I suppose. It's the Pompano Pharmacy in, in, in Broward County. Uh, we have obtained the, the prescription records uh, showing that, the, that that particular drugstore has filled hundreds of uh, prescriptions written by a certain veterinarian in Georgia. Who's the veterinarian? Uh, his name from the records that we've obtained is Dr. Brogdon. Dr. Brogdon. Right. You haven't met him personally nope, yet. Nope, I haven't met him, and, and he's not in Florida, and I don't have any jurisdiction over him in Florida. These prescriptions were all issued to trainers. It's all issued. Directly connected with horses. Is, that it? is yes. there a track near there? Near this drugstore? Yeah. Yes, it's, there's a, uh, a major horse track located almost within a mile of this particular pharmacy. Well, you're saying, in effect, that a better at a Florida racetrack might as well be blindfolded and poke at the next card with a needle as far as knowing uh, how the horses rate. Right now, if any better walked into my office and said, Mr. Bradley, a horse is being drugged this afternoon at, at the horse tracks, I would have to say, probably so. From all evidence and from all indication that we have, you're probably betting on a drugged horse. You're essentially saying, or you know Florida best, but you also know the racing situation in general. That horse racing is in a mess in the United States, maybe a little worse than usual in Florida, but it's a mess, right? It's a, it's a, a major mess, and if the state regulatory authorities don't do what is necessary to stop especially the use of these powerful illegal drugs, not only in Florida, but in Illinois, in California, New York, because none of us are immune from it, if we don't spend the money, hire the personnel, pass the laws, impose the harshest penalty that we can possibly impose, and if we don't take those actions, then I think that the future of horse racing in America is going to be mighty dim. Veterinarian Brogdon has denied doing anything wrong and says that his prescriptions were for quarter horses in training and were not to be used illegally during racing. The owner of the Pompano Pharmacy said that he stopped filling these prescriptions when a federal agent indicated there might be a problem. And last Thursday, the Florida lab found sublimase in a frozen urine sample. The trainer had received a prescription for sublimase from Dr. Brogdon and had it filled at the Pompano Pharmacy.